It is probably the first event to commemorate the Madras Day or the Madras Week. And we have an eminent speaker, Vikram Raghavan, who has come down to talk about the maps, or rather he calls it many maps of Madras. Just to give you a short introduction, Vikram Raghavan is a non-resident who is passionate about every facet of the history and heritage of Madras, that is Chennai. By day, Vikram is a lead counsel at an international finance institution in Washington, D.C. His work focuses on armed conflicts, refugees, humanitarian crisis, development projects, and macroeconomic issues. A philatelist who began collecting stamps as a Madras schoolboy, Vikram is fascinated by antique prints, watercolors, miniature bronzes, and historical artifacts, including the magnificent aqua tints and maps of Madras. Without further ado, I have great pleasure in inviting Vikram to make his presentation. And towards the later half of the presentation, I too would make a small presentation based on the population of the city. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chandramali, and <coughs> thanks to you and uh, Sabari for <coughs> having me here today. And uh, I also want to thank all of you for coming out at relatively short notice on this uh, Friday evening. Um, I know that uh, this is a crowd that's a mixed crowd in the sense that there are students from high schools, but also people who are obviously eminent citizens of the city, and a lot of people who, like me, are just interested in a variety of subjects with no particular affiliation or um, sort of subject matter, or claim to subject matter expertise. So that is what I'm hoping to pitch this talk at, which is sort of the um, common person, uh, because this is a subject which behooves a great scholarly approach, but also from multiple disciplines. Um, it is a, you know, a subject that can claim historians, geographers, um, military um, experts, uh, maritime relations people, anthropologists, uh, sociologists, architects. Uh, I'm not any of them. Um, and so I don't claim to be an expert. Uh, I'm not a historian, nor am I a cartographer. And so I have chosen this topic, and uh, I want to say that I'm not, uh, I don't pretend I know everything. And so I'm hoping I can pre approach it with as much humility as I can, and I look forward to being corrected, admonished, or um, counseled by you all in the Q&A about uh, things that you may know uh, more intimately than I do. Uh, and so this is not necessarily a one sort of one side lecture. And I've been told that CIC events are good uh, in their give and take. So I hope that will happen. Um, I um, also want to sort of you know reflect briefly on what we will be talking about in the following outline. Uh, first, we will look at how we locate Madras on a map, then the early maps of Fort St. George, um, war and peace in Madras, which is an interesting theme, lots of battles, and how that reflected in the cartographical representations of the city, the great trigonometrical survey, which of course began here and which we therefore should be more proud of, um, the city beyond the fort, because uh, Many people have urged me, don't make this entirely a talk on Fort St. George, and it is not. Residency and railway maps, looking beyond the fort and the city to the hinterland or to the presidency and beyond. And then finally, some reflections on mapping contemporary Chennai, because this is not just all history. Right? There is also the living uh, present of a map, and who gets to make maps, and you know, who are the stakeholders in map making is something that I thought I would reflect on. I also wanted to dedicate this talk to Mr. Mutaya, who, among other, other things, inspired me <coughs> to, uh, to choose uh, uh, to be interested in history, but also a history of the city, but also history generally, but also encouraged me to speak in public, which, you know, I, um, uh, my only regret is he's not here to listen to this talk. Um, but um, I'm grateful that, uh, um, you know, other friends of his, Mr. Vincent D'Souza, who's here, who encouraged me the editor of Mylapur Times, who encouraged me to actually put this together, uh, also uh, sort of represents that tradition. So let's, without further ado, get on to the 
sort of the first module, which is locating Madras on a map. Now, this requires a bit of delving into prehistory because we know that India's ancient traditions, mathematics, um, sort of astronomy, included speculations about the Earth's circumference and latitude and longitude. Uh, but uh, does this mean our ancients used maps? Uh, and I would say yes, but the problem is we haven't found any, uh, at least in terms of depictions. Um, and so these maps may exist, but they haven't been discovered yet. Uh, we do know that Chinese pilgrims came to India, and so obviously there must have been some representation of where they were going, even if they didn't have a four-dot map like we have. Uh, but we haven't yet found uh, sort of at least inscriptions that would resemble the uh, you know, idea of a map as we know it today. But I do want to acknowledge that because, you know, obviously it can be a subject of some contention uh, to say that this is something which obviously requires more study. And so we therefore turn to the Western cartog cartographical tradition to begin our understanding, impoverished as it may be, of this topic. Uh, and that begins with this person, uh, Ptolemy, Claudius Ptolemy, who lived between 90 and 168 of the Common Era. Uh, he was a Roman geographer who lived in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, Ptolemy actually did not make any maps because you will find always references of Ptolemaic maps, but he never actually sat down and he didn't have a draft board to actually prepare a map. Instead, he published a treatise, a geography, where he described the world that the ancients, of course, the ancients, the Greco-Roman ancients knew. And uh, this, of course, included Western and South Southern Asia and Northern Africa. This book, though, was lost during the Middle Ages in Europe. And it's the Arabs who rediscovered it and gave it back to the Europeans, this Ptolemaic book. And so from the Ptolemy geography, you have principles that inform maps that are then accredited to Ptolemy. Um, and so these are almost a thousand year later uh, maps that sort of kind of give a vivid graphical expression to the Ptolemaic principles. So this, of course, is therefore an understanding of India through Ptolemy and then, you know, transposed through some Western European who had to interpret what a text of a thousand years before him um, said. And right, obviously, therefore, the, the, the depictions here are approximate, they are crude, they are primitive, they are not obviously exact, but they do, uh, you know, you. We, we can recognize them, we are familiar with them, right? So this, of course, uh, is an important topic which we can keep talking, but we need to move on, which is this book, which I don't know if, uh, how widely it's known, but I heard about it through some talk by Sriram, and uh, I, it was my regret I hadn't read it all this while. K.V. Raman was a student of, um, um, uh, you know, Nilakant Shastri, the great historian uh, of Madras University, and uh, this book he wrote as his PhD thesis in 1955. And uh, Nandita Krishna managed to convince him to go back and do a second edition, which CPR now has published and you can buy for 200 rupees in their uh, shop in Eldams Road. And I encourage you to do so. It's a wonderful book because it really is about the prehistory of this city and the region. And so, of course, you can see here he has created a map which is not really a, an ancient map, but a map of the ancients or the map of the medieval uh, shrines uh, of the area that we live in. And so you have Tirvatyu, Tirvanmur, um, um, Triple K, and Mailapur, all of these depicted as uh, spots on a map uh, of the vicinity of Madras, even though the idea of Madras really comes later, right? at least as we know it today. Um, and so this is, of course, another thing we must acknowledge in our quest for understanding where Madras is on a map. Then we move on to something called the Catalan Atlas, and we move here because of K.V. Raman. K.V. Raman's book says that this atlas, the Catalan Atlas, which is one of the most spectacular, I mean, it's you know, several frames uh, in the uh, uh, French National Library, that this Catalan at Atlas has a reference to what he calls Mirapur. And K.V. Raman says that this is none other than, uh, none other than our Mailapur. Um, now, again, uh, whether this is true or not, I do not uh, have the means or the expertise to fully investigate. But it is reflective of the fact that Western cartographical traditions had sort of quaint ideas of India, right? And so they got some spots and, you know, they reflected them. 
And um, this, of course, then uh, changes when Jahangir starts uh, receiving European visitors. Of course, the Portuguese had already arrived by 1498 uh, in, uh, in, in Kerala, but it's really uh, at the Jahangir court that you have a stream of uh, visitors who, in a way, the whole sort of interchange between the Mughal court and, the, and Europe takes place, and with it, ideas of representation of the Mughal Empire in particular uh, sort of get seeded in the European imagination. And so we have this fascinating map, Magni Moglis Imperium, the great Mughal Empire, um, which is a early map, uh, not that early, but it's the, a map produced uh, in the year that our city was founded, modern city. Uh, and this um, map, in a way, sort of reflects the sort of received wisdom from travelers coming back from India. And so you find, for instance, it does have some interesting approximations. The Ganges is shown as flowing from north to west, uh, north to south. Um, and then, of course, uh, sadly for us, the rest of peninsula India is cut off uh, below Machalipatnam. Um, so, of course, you also have the cartouche, or the, uh, sorry, the, um, the seal of the, the emperor up there, the Mughal emperor, which is Jahangir. So uh, this, of course, is sort of as close as it gets to Madras in the year that Madras is founded. But obviously, Madras is then a shack or a, a small, you know, four rooms or four walls. So obviously, it is not yet ready to be making its mark on a map. So we then move on to uh, Sao Tome or San Tome, right? Because remember, the Portuguese arrive and create a colony or a, an, a, in a settlement in San Tome. Um, many, many years before uh, the British uh, land in Madras. In 1522, the Portuguese arrived. Um, and this, therefore, puts our area on a Western map much before sort of Madras or Fort St. George. And so here is a book by Sanjay Subramaniam. Some of you may know he's our foreign minister's brother uh, and a great scholar of uh, India and Europe, knows many European languages. And in his book, India and Europe, which is a remarkable book, a new book, uh, he sort of plots all of the European sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of, you know, places of uh, establishment, uh, but particularly the Portuguese. Um, and here, of course, we have Sao Tome, but of course, uh, Madras is not yet there. Um, we move on, though, just very quickly to back to Madras, but before that, we need to, again, I think Vincent has talked about this more in his blogs and in his columns, is to get a better understanding of this fascinating place that we sort of negotiate our way through if you don't happen to live in Santhome, right? Which is a historic part of our city, much older than the British parts, of, which is Santhome. And uh, we, again, don't have as much documentary evidence uh, on what actually was Santhome in terms of a Portuguese colony. So there are in the French National Archives and in the Portuguese archives, lots of interesting maps of Santhome. And I could spend the rest of the hour doing that, but we obviously have to move on, to only to say that this is, if you go, for instance, and stand just behind the basilica, where you know there's that, pla that uh, sort of rod which uh, commemorates the tsunami, you do see some sort of semblance of a rampart, right? So it is possible that this didn't, it wasn't a fort like we had, uh, like we had in Fort St. George or in Sadras, but you know, there was some sort of you know, built up settlement. And we do have maps that show some sort of uh, 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 fortifications in Santom. But it is then uh, with Santom sort of providing the cover that the first uh, sort of dots or the first uh, images uh, or points on a map uh, reflecting Madras show up. And so the first, very first one, I think perhaps one of the first ones, is this map uh, by Johan Niehoff, a Dutch map ma maker, 1682, 40 years into the making of Madras. And finally, you see Madras Patnam showing up next to Santom, right? Uh, so this is 40 years into the making of the city. And so obviously, uh, Madras Patnam, uh, Fort St. George does uh, show up. Now, we have to move on, though, uh, to one interesting thing, that, which is on this issue of location. I had always had the strongest view that uh, the name change, which we don't need to debate here, uh, was, uh, let's say, had different authentic uh, dimensions to it. Is it a Tamil name or is it a Telugu name? Was it authentic to change? We can hold that debate for a second. And I have to say, I myself was startled by what I discovered in preparing for this talk, 
which is I always thought Madras was the name, and then you know there are lots of different you ask depending on who you ask. Chennai has different sort of uh, explanations for the origins. But to my surprise, in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, I found this map, which is a map that the Bibliothèque says is from 1600 to 1799. I actually think this is more 1600 to 1650 to 1700, which actually talks about Sinapatnam. So this is, uh, made me rethink my own idea, you know, that Madras is the most authentic name and is the historic name, but because uh, this is, there's no mention of Madras, and obviously this is right bang where, you know, the fort would have been. So, interesting. Um, so, we move on, which is to the early plans of Fort St. George. Um, and here we begin with this map by this guy called Friar. Friar was a surgeon of the East India Company. You can actually download this remarkable book, which you can get lost in, uh, in uh, from Internet Archive. And he talks about, you know, his travels around uh, sort of Asia, East Asia, uh, East Asia, you know, onto the sort of Spice Islands. And he talks about his visit to Madras, which was, of course, you know, still sort of a small settlement. And he then produces what we know as the first map. And this is actually the map in his book, uh, which you can get. But uh, a variation of this map is reproduced in the classic uh, three-volume book on the history of Madras. Uh, Henry Davison Love, uh, we'll come back to him in a second, uh, his Vestiges of Old Madras, and he produces sort of, I guess, an embellished version of the Friar map, right? Now, uh, Love, for a minute, just to segue, is a remarkable uh, guy. I mean, we didn't have a photo of him. I emailed his gra great-grandson, who's a sanitation engineer, and he sent me his wedding photograph. So now we actually know what Love looked like, like at least, uh, well, this is his daughter's wedding photograph, sorry. He does look rather old for his own wedding. Um, but uh, this is, uh, in a way, the classic four volumes, right? And uh, I encourage all of you to download it if you can't actually, it's hard to get the original, but Asian publishing has produced a very decent version. The problem is there are spectacular maps uh, in the love volumes which are hard to reproduce. Uh, so that is why getting the originals is something which um, is worth and, um, you know, sort of looking at um, the maps um, uh, online don't do full justice. But Henry Davison Love sort of produces, as I said, the first prior map. And it's interesting what they, it's depicted. So you have, for instance, the outer ramparts uh, of the fort. Um, the four outer citadel has four turrets, each of which are loaded with 10 guns. Uh, and then on the southeast walls, you have the flag, the old flag. Sri Ram has written an article about this whole thing. Why was it this flag, not the Union Jack? I won't uh, uh, sort of waste time on that. It's uh, just to direct you to that article, which is very interesting. And then, of course, the governor's house uh, or factory house, which is in the middle of the uh, fort, right? And so if you believe Mutaya, uh, you know, the present chief minister's chamber, in a way, is that sanctum uh, where it all happened. Um, I don't know if it's actually, you know, uh, sort of preserved. I have certainly not been in there. Maybe there are others who've been into that, you know, great center of power. But obviously, it is in that kernel uh, which, from which the fort, the fort emerged and the world around it. And so therefore, it is important, uh, and you can see it depicted here in the very first map with some significance. Right? It almost looks like a mosque. Um, now, the other interesting thing about this map is this church. This is approximately where that multi-story building, Namakal, Kavinyar Malige, presently is, right? Uh, which is itself undergoing restoration, has been since I discovered the other day when we went to visit, it, uh, visit the fort. And uh, it is very interesting because this is a Catholic church. This is St. Andrew's church. This, there is no sign of St. Mary's church, which we all know. And we all know, I've been told, it's the oldest uh, Anglican church east of the Suez Canal. This is a line from love. That's how all of us have learned it. But why is it not here? Because it was only built in 1680, and this is a map from 1673. But the Catholics were in the, ch in the fort already. And the reason for that is, again, you know, a long story, but they were later kicked out because the British got suspicious, right? They were obviously not Catholic uh, after Henry VIII. And uh, that church was pulled down, uh, although there was a time when both churches existed, St. Mary's and uh, St. Andrew's. Now, beyond the ramparts, you see the makings of the so-called black town. Um, uh, Andrew Cogan and Francis Day, the two founders of the fort, had a dubarsh called Beritimapa, who brought weavers from Nellore and from other places in Andhra 
to weave the cloth, the muslin, which is really the purpose for which Madras was founded, right, which was to, to get cheap cloth. And so these, since it was a relatively uninhabited areas except for a few fishing villages which were itinerant, these people were invited to stay outside the, the walls of the fort. And uh, this is the origins of the so-called black town. Um, I don't know if Mr. Rajashekaran is in the audience. Uh, oh, here, here, there he is. Yeah, I strongly encourage you to read his uh, fascinating article on the Dalit uh, uh, temples and uh, sort of the Dalit uh, um, um, sort of dimensions or the uh, origins of Blacktown, which is fascinating. Um, um, so let's move on, though, to, uh, again, more maps, but we don't have to compare each of them. Just to show you, this idea of the fort itself kept changing as the edifice probably kept evolving. And so you have the Langley map, which Mutaya says looks like New York City. Uh, and then uh, I think he meant the grid system. Um, and then, of course, you have this map, which neither Mutaya nor Love, for whatever reason, found, because obviously they didn't have sophisticated search tools, uh, which is a plan uh, which, uh, you know, map from 1687. So this is sort of, you know, again, you can, there are lots more we can now discover. It's a subject unto itself. And we come to what is called the Pitts map. The Pitts map, in a way, is our most famous map. If you do a Google search for a map of Madras, you're likely to get some variation of the Pitts map. There's a fantastic blog piece by Bordelin Library, the Oxford Library, where the original resides. This is a photo of that original, which explains why this map was created. It was ref reflecting a survey of Governor Pitt, the uh, governor of Madras, who ordered the creation of this map. And the Pitts map is, again, you know, like the Friar map, has lots of interesting details. But look at how the fort has now sort of diminished in comparison to the world around it, right? You see the black town much bigger than the fort. And then also you have, I suppose, the origins of, you know, a parade ground, whatever. But you can see there's a lot more activity beyond the fort. And that is very clear in the Pitts map. We're now almost 70 years from the founding of the, of the fort. And the Pitts map, in a way, then is sort of copied, made, variations are made. And it sort of is the map that goes viral. Because this pit map then gets made, uh, picked up by this guy, Herman Moll, who's a famous map maker, and they put it into, you know, atlases and, you know, geography books. And the pit map is, in a way, the map that makes Madras known all over the world. Because at that point, Madras is still emerging, and it's really the pit map that sort of puts Madras on the map. Uh, let's look at uh, the pit map a little bit. Um, the... Uh, uh, fort, of course, is still there if we sort of zoom in, um, and the um, fort's uh, ramparts are still there. We now see St. Mary's Church, which makes an appearance, which was built in 1680, right? Uh, you still have the, um, you still have the, if you can see there, the St. Andrews, the Catholic Church. But going outside the fort, you have Pedernaik and Pet and Mutrialpet, the two parts of the so-called black town, uh, which are much bigger, right? And so you can see that starkly represented in the Pitts map. Now, again, like I said, the Pitts map goes viral. So not only is it reproduced as a standalone piece in lots of atlases, it's also put into inserts in very famous maps. This is one of the most famous maps of, of Asia and, and East India and the, and the Indies, so-called. Uh, and look at how prominently uh, the pit map is depicted in this map, which is actually one of the most sought after maps. I certainly don't have it of, of, of map collectors. But um, uh, it sort of, you know, like I said, gives a prominence to the city that uh, it otherwise lacked, right? Now, we move on, uh, and we can keep talking about the maps of the fort, but we need to end this part and move to the next. But I did want to show you one book, um, which is this book, fantastic book. It's called The Story of Fort St. George, a small little book. Uh, there is a published version of it uh, by the Asian Publishing, and you can also download the original from Internet Archive. But it's a remarkable book, and I actually have here a mint original copy. Uh, and it's remarkable because what... Um, D.M. Reed, who's an interesting, it's a book actually printed in Madras in 1945. Uh, he actually produces uh, the, the, the fort as it evolves, right? So you can see it according to the different ma uh, maps. And if that's not to be uh, outdone, here's even more, right? So he shows you, in a way, until 1939, because the book was published in 1945, the fort from 1653 to 1939. 
Now, what is interesting, if my friend uh, Vincent will allow me to uh, indulge him in a photo, as you can see here, he is appraising the, pit ma uh, the, the, uh, the, the Reed book, and we went on, this, on a tour led by the uh, Reed book and didn't lead us astray. In fact, uh, that either shows you that not much has changed or that, you know, Reed was very good. Um, and uh, what is very interesting is in the Fort Museum, you find on the first floor, uh, these um, maps, right, they are direct photocopy reproductions of the, of the Reed book. So this is me holding it up to show where they actually came from, right? So anyway, that's uh, if you want to get to the fort, and the fort museum first floor is, you know, sort of uh, depicts that evolution and expansion. The issue of maps of war and peace. Now, since the city is founding in 1640, uh, it soon it becomes the envy of lots of different powers, right? Who want to displace the displace the British from the fort and kick them out, and for various reasons, right? It's a, a bulwark, and they want to to conquer it. And so, very quickly, you find the fort itself becoming fortified. And so, these vast sort of uh, you know uh, ramparts. What do you call them? It's the army map. Uh, uh, Colonel Shankar from the Indian Army. Uh, and uh, basically, they get deeper. Right and and wider and and stouter uh, uh, and this is partly because of the threat, the threat that they are facing from land but also from sea. Uh, of course, from the sea threat, there's not much one can do. Uh, you don't have powerful sea cannons, uh, so you try and protect that right uh, sort of that vulnerability. But around the land, you sort of beef this up, and uh, this is an anticipation of a threat that did materialize uh, three times, right? They or more than three times if you add also Hyder Ali. Uh, primarily from the French, but also from other forces. And so the most important battle that we all know of is the Battle of 1746, which is really um, a out sort of, let's say, um, um, a, um, uh, it's an offshoot of the War of Austrian Succession. And uh, the British and the French fight a fairly nasty ba uh, battle around sort of Madras in Triplicane and in the areas around the fort. And in three days, the city falls. The British walk out, um, and the uh, French flag is hoisted. And for three years, the French flag flies over Fort St. George. Now, that is itself another subject unto itself. But what is very interesting is the depictions. Uh, we find the original sort of sketch of the scene, as if someone took a photo and uploaded it, and it sort of, you know, in terms of to show what happened, uh, is a guy called Paradis, who was a French soldier, uh, who was basically uh, at the fort uh, or around the fort in terms of um, uh, witnessing what happened. And so Paradis, uh, his sketch of the battle or the scene of action is, uh, captures the uh, imagination of map makers around the world. And for some reason, this goes again viral. Uh, it's picked up by this famous map maker called John Rock, who has a shop at the Strand. This is not a map ripped from an atlas. It's a freestanding free, free sheet-based map. And John Rock, who also was close to the Mad King, King George III, uh, makes this map of basically the battle positions of Madras in 1746, the day on, I think, uh, uh, on in the September day that it actually fell to the French. Uh, this is a very famous map, and of course, it therefore gets into the royal collection. And here you find the writing of uh, King George III uh, in his royal collection, he keeps a copy of this map. So this is a very important map, uh, perhaps outsized influence uh, for given the fact there were much bigger battles being fought, uh, but yet, you know, again, a map is a map and why it got there is a different story. Now, there was of course, uh, because of the, uh, tree, the piece of uh, Ix la Chapelle, uh, the uh, fort handed back to the British, but there was another challenge, which was read by this guy, Count de Lally, uh, and, uh, you know, they spent a long time having those French troops come up, and of course, like Napoleon, you know, went to uh, Russia forgetting about the winter, uh, they forgot about the northeast monsoon. And uh, it was on one of those days when I sort of made that journey, I realized why these guys actually never reached the fort because it was impossible, right? It was very hard to uh, um, sort of reach uh, impossible, uh, to sort of, you know, make your way through the, um, uh, through the waterlogged uh, the fields. Uh, and so this um, sort of French uh, assault on the fort, which, you know, gets 
almost close, is ultimately repulsed uh, by another battle. Um, and the fort, uh, of course, doesn't fall. But it scares the British enough that they make the fortifications even wider and bigger and thicker. Right? So here's the fort from 1759. And you can really see uh, the, the, the defense is now as big as the area uh, that they are supposed to uh, defend. Right? And another important thing happens, which you can see here in this, uh, this uh, I guess, uh, early depiction of, of the fort after the French siege, the second siege uh, of 1759, um, there is kind of a no man's land created. And what that basically means is if you look, for instance, then at this map from 1780, the black town which we saw in the Friar map, which hugged the outer ramparts of the fort, where today RBI is, is pushed back, right? And they basically create sort of this uh, buffer zone to avoid, to, for security purposes, right? And so that's really where, uh, you know, Esplanade, Broadway all come up later. Um, and so you see this here in the beautiful aquatint of William and Thomas Daniel. We'll meet them in a second. But they show you the black town. But the, the black town that they're showing you is really you know, barely seen. It's in the distance. What they are showing you is really this buffer zone uh, that was created after the uh, second uh, sort of French siege uh, to keep, you know, sort of uh, threats away. Now, uh, I want to finish this part, of course, with the Emden, because what uh, talk on the maps of Madras or Madras can, uh, and war can be complete without the Emden, which, of course, enters the imagination of every person who lives in the city. Um, and, of course, the SS Emden story, again, de deserves to be told in a fuller, greater detail. But uh, one of the things the Emden did, uh, when the, we now know from the captain's uh, memoirs, it was to scare the inhabitants, right? So they lie, you know, the shells land and create a lot of commotion because they, you know, they bomb some fuel stations. But we have a soldier or a sailor on M the Emden who keeps a map of where the Emden went, right? And he maintains the screwed map, which is now in the Australian War Memorial, uh, of the places visited by the Emden to harass people, as the captain said. And then, of course, it finds, uh, it, it lists Madras, and then it shows the ultimate uh, resting point of the Emden, where it, Emden was finally sort of pursued and, and sunk, right? So again, uh, that I thought is interesting because this is a map that we didn't know existed. Now, we move on to, very quickly, the great trigonom trigonometrical survey. Uh, I think the basics are well known. Arthur Lambden, uh, William Landon uh, was the person who convinced the East, Euro in East India Company uh, to undertake the survey. And again, I'm not an engineer, so please forgive my very crude approximation. But in my ta sort of non-technical uh, mind, uh, trigonometrical survey, because I've forgotten what cos cosine and all of that stuff is, is basically you have a map, a point, uh, and then you have a baseline, uh, which basically links two points. And then you determine the distance from these two points, uh, or third point from you know, the distance of these two points by uh, deploying some sort of angle. Right? Uh, that's how you basically you know, find the distance of a point that's away. Uh, fantastic application of sort of you know, old geography, but in a, um, in, a, in, in a sort of more modern context. Now, of course, uh, this trigonometrical survey revolutionizes map making because until now, all surveying in India is basically topographical, right? You go and look and see what you can find and then represent it, right? It didn't involve any scientific or mathematical calculations until the trigonometrical survey, for which they use this instrument called the theodolite. Right? This big, massive thing had to be hauled around India. Uh, legend has it that it was put on top of the big pagoda and then crashed. Uh, whether that is true or not, I do not know. But uh, it obviously showed the amount of effort. It took 70 years for this exercise to be complete. Uh, and Langdon's successor, Everest, completes it. And of course, you know, they, in the process, map the highest peak, which is why it gets Everest the fame and the name, right? Uh, but all this began here, right here, at St. Thomas Mount. Uh, and uh, this is actually a painting of St. Thomas Mount around that time. Uh, and here you find here uh, what Langdon does. He starts at the base using St. Thomas Mount as the base. And then he creates a second point, right? Oh, sorry, so the first point and then the base is uh, this Perumbakam Hill. And that is, in a way, the base for the whole mapping of India this uh, base between St. Thomas Mount and Perumbakam, right? You can see here, this is his first 
um, the, 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 this is sort of the first uh, uh, installment of, of, of the mapping process, and it all begins right here. And then you see here, for instance, that now recognizing his uh, contributions, the ASI just behind the, the, uh, the church on, uh, in St. Thomas Mount has installed a bust of Saint, uh, of not Saint, as well, of Colonel uh, William Langdon. So uh, this exercise, of course, you know, sort of maps uh, or, or charts, uh, surveys the entire country, uh, including the peaks of the Himalayas. And after its uh, findings are uh, released, it transforms map making so that every map post the survey has to carry this legend that it is based on the survey. Otherwise, no one wants to read it, right? Because when you have the scientific data, why not use it? So that then means lots of interesting new maps that show us the city beyond the fort, right? Which now comes into that uh, uh, dimension of, you know, how is the city evolving? And there we see the city through the eyes of these two fantastic, probably the most famous painters, British Indian painters of India. Uh, their collections are on display in, the, in different, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, places, even in the city. Um, the uncle and nephew pair, Thomas and William Daniel, they come to Madras around 1797, 1798. Uh, the fourth Mysore war has still not happened, but yet, you know, the threat has receded and moved, uh, sort of moved there, right? There's this uneasy peace of Sri Rangapatnam. And so in that time, they come, and of course, the fort is still the center of gravity, so then one of their most famous paintings is the southeast view of the fort, and they have different views of the fort, but they also go beyond the fort, and they come here very close to where we are, uh, which is the Sairapet Bridge, the, the Armenian Bridge, and that church is actually not St. Thomas Mount, it's the Little Mount Church. Uh, and so this is another famous painting of the Daniels, which shows now the city beyond the fort. And uh, the other thing they do, which is somewhat unknown, because uh, it is not as famous as their paintings, which are then made into prints, this was not made into a print, is the panorama of Madras, a beautiful, brilliant uh, sort of uh, depiction of the skyline of the city. Uh, there is one person in Madras who actually has an original replica of this uh, uh, fantastic piece of work, but the original, of course, lies at the British Museum, and what is interesting is the detail, right? So it's almost like they went on, you know, and did like a 360 degree, and then tried to chart the uh, various monuments or the landmarks, and that shows you also, therefore, in turn, the city around the fort that's developing. And this process of building the city around the fort gathers steam, because remember, this is 1798. In 1799, uh, Sri Rangapatna falls, Tipu is vanquished, and the uh, fall of Sri Rangapatna allows the British to get out of the fort, because they were first terrified of the French, then there was the Hyder Ali Tipu uh, sort of threat, and so with relative peace, the British decide to move the governor out of the fort, right? And so the governor is then moved into what was the Raj Bhavan or the governor's house until 1947, which of course is now pulled down where the multi-speciality hospital is. But of course, this is the other building, which is Rajadi Hall, which was originally to be a council chamber, but then built as a banqueting hall by the second uh, um, governor Cliff, Edward Cliff, uh, Clive, sorry, uh, Edward Clive, the governor, the son of Robert Clive. And he gets Goldingham, the great polymath who, you know, among other things, discovers uh, the inscriptions in um, uh, Mamalapuram uh, builds the, um, uh, the, astron the observatory, the, uh, has astronomical ex uh, experiments, but is also a fantastic architect who builds Rajadi Hall, which we now know is going to be renovated. But this also shows you the city is expanding beyond the fort, right? And so this is evident then in the maps that come uh, in the 19th century. You, one of them, uh, the most famous one, is by this guy called Talboyt Wheelers. He's sort of a pre- H.D. Love figure. He's a guy who writes a book called Madras in the Olden Days, but the book itself was written in 1861, and so he's talking about olden days, olden to 1861, right? And so this book uh, has a beautiful map. Uh, it's a stunning map, uh, which was created by uh, Talboy's Wheeler without much, I don't, he was a professor of philosophy. I don't think he knew much about map making, but uh, he first shows you Madras and its environs, and uh, in 1733, and the city you can see has moved beyond the fort. This is Nungambakam on the western periphery up to Ennore. And then look at what he does. He juxtaposes this with the city in 1862. He kind of creates them as a visual contrast in this beautiful book, right? And he shows you how the city has changed. And look at how much development, right? 
the fort now has shrunk in size or relatively uh, relative size to the city behind it. So there's great development, of course, towards the north and then also towards the west. Of course, the south stops here in this case, not, not even goes to the Adia River, sort of stops, I suppose, with triplicane. But it does show you at least the great amount of uh, growth of the city towards the north, right? So we move on, uh, which is basically to this map, which is probably the most famous map, which was the cover that we used for this announcement. Uh, it is by one of the most famous map makers, William Fadden, who makes the most exquisite, well sought after maps even today. He made one map of Madras, which is this one, and it has really painstaking detail, right? So if we again insert into the Fadden map, 1814, uh, based on a survey of 1814, prepared, uh, uh, produced in 1816, you see Nungambakam, you see uh, Kilpok, here you see Egmore, right? Uh, and then you see here the Great Choultry Plain, that is actually Mount Road uh, snaking its way, but not much else there. Um, and then of course here you see the south bank of the Adia River, where we are, nothing. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the great tank, which is today's Tinagar, which again uh, remains sort of uninhabited until 1920 or not sort of populated, right? There were other people who had country houses, perhaps. So we can go on and on. Here's another interesting map which was produced for the justices, why it was very important to show property demarcations, because now that is very important. Uh, so this is a fantastic map uh, in the French archives. And then we have the first tourists that land in, in the city, right? People are now visiting the city, not just for business or to see relatives, but also to see what the Daniels are, you know, saying is a beautiful place to come and visit, right? And so remember, this is a city at that time which doesn't have a natural harbor. The harbor is only built uh, in uh, much later, um, which uh, is my stuff, yeah. Uh, in, 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 you know, sort of close to the end of the 19th century. But if you wanted to come to Madras, uh, for much of its history, you had to take a boat which was called an East India Man. You can see them at the distance. They were the 747s of that time. And you had to get off uh, sort of, you know, in not deep sea, but, you know, in sort of farther away from the coast, at least three miles, and then make your way through these Masula boats whose operators you were at the mercy. And so you could have survived a one-year journey without being killed by pirates or, you know, being sort of, let's say, scarred by uh, some terrible disease, but yet uh, the most treacherous part was this last two, uh, the, this last uh, mile. And this, in a way, represents the arrival of people to the city, but it also is a good depiction to something we move on as we sort of come to the end of this part of the talk and uh, the, this, this presentation, which is the first handbooks of Madras for people who are visiting here who have no particular antecedents. They have no uh, friend from the East India Company uh, uh, that they can come and visit. Uh, and so here you find the emergence of what we call as tour guides, the Murray's Handbook of Madras. And here's a beautiful, uh, they also have maps obviously, but more importantly, they tell you where to stay. We have the first emergence of the first hotels of the city, right? So um, finally, th to finish this part, you see this uh, another spectacular map, 1907. This is part of the Gazettia series, which has beautiful maps of the whole country. Uh, and you see the city again, a city that's growing, a city that's expanding, but a city that is still also has lots of pockets of still uh, paddy and uh, um, sort of uh, shrubland, right? Uh, and also you still have sort of the southern boundary as the Adia River, right? Um, so um, I just want to end this by just showing you the presidency maps, again a topic unto itself because this is much bigger. Uh, you can see the richness and the detail, again a product of the great trigonometrical survey. The other reason I wanted to show you this for a second was this is where we get the first map, to my knowledge, made in Tamil. When I started working on this book, I asked lots of my Tamil scholar friends, what is the first map produced in Tamil? And I was given some strange answers. I was told Pudumaipudan had written this map in some book in 1951. I said, surely that could not have been the first map, right? But to my knowledge, and again, I'm willing to be proved wrong, or maybe there is a map that exists. This is the first map in Tamil, produced by somebody we don't know, Nathamuni. Naidu, it's actually at the Bodleian College in Oxford, and it's a fantastic map because he's taken the trouble to actually create it without duplicating some English map, right? So he has to come up with things like Chennai Rajdhani to show the presidency, right? So, you know, that kind of thing. So there's also a Telugu map like this, and then of course the railway maps. The railway maps are again another subject unto itself. 
I want to end by some reflections on contemporary mapping in Chennai, and again, as a non-resident citizen of the city. Um, now, as you may know, the GCC website has very interesting, very nice maps, uh, and uh, I invite you to visit their website if you haven't. Um, and then if you are a voter, you can actually download your ward maps. I am a voter in Ward uh, 176, so this is my local ward map. Uh, and now, of course, with the five commissionerates, you now have sort of police commissioner maps, and now I think last week they announced they're going to have heat maps on crime statistics, right? Uh, so, you know, again, showing you different mapping, uh, uh, how mapping uh, can be used in different ways. And of course, I think maybe you're going to talk about it, uh, Mr. Chandramali, uh, the CMDA, the master plan maps, which show, you know, lots of different things, land use surveys, right? Um, but I did want to, and then of course, now our imagination of the city itself is, uh, has to expand because of the announcement of the CMA, right? It's much bigger than uh, what the basic area was. But I did want to sort of end by talking about this idea of the transit maps. So we have these fantastic different means of uh, transport. You have the MRTS, you have the su su suburban railway, bus system, uh, metro. We don't have a map that talks to all of them. Uh, it's impossible to create, at least to my knowledge, we don't have a map that fully integrates this data. So this is the Indian Railways map of their assets, right, of the Southern Rail. And curiously, it doesn't have, to my knowledge, the metro, the metro on this map. But so what people have done is, uh, uh, people have used open source to sort of step in, to create this void, right? So you find people on Twitter uh, who are putting out these maps as a public service that integrate the transit elements, right? The, uh, the metro with the suburban railway and the MRTS. This guy, Ravi Shankar, uh, has done one. Uh, and then there's this other guy, um, uh, Ramaswamy, who lives in Cardiff or some other place which uh, is not here. But he's produced this very interesting map, both in Tamil and English, uh, which tries to juxtapose everything beautifully, right? Uh, uh, and again, though, it misses buses, right? Uh, and if you're taking a bus, you want to know really how you can get from one point to the other seamlessly by whatever mode. So that is the challenge that I, I, I think that contemporary map making faces, and it does raise these questions. What is a map? Who produces a map? For whom are you producing it? How do you ensure it's accurate? And what sort of common public good is served by a map? Do we have maps of community parks? Do we have maps of biking trails? Do you have maps of recreation facilities or public areas beyond just a beach or a mall, right? So those sort of uh, things are uh, what I think are important issues uh, where map making is not just an elite hobby or a sort of a curiosity of history, it's really a lived reality. And so here, for instance, is the new CMRL phase two map, uh, again, only showing you the metro, right? Uh, but you could also have the issue of what is flood prone, you know, what are the flood prone areas of the city? Uh, and, you know, the plan now to use sort of uh, geospatial systems to map the water assets, right? So I want to leave you uh, with these sort of random reflections and thank you again for coming out this evening and thank you again to the Chennai International Center for giving me this opportunity and for you for your patience. Thanks. After that fantastic presentation, let me bring you down to contemporary Chennai. So this is a work which we did for Mr. Muthaya when we brought out the Gazetteer of Modern Madras. And uh, I had the opportunity of working with him and produce one of the chapters on demography uh, in that uh, three volume. The first volume has uh, my work on that. And I thought I would just expand on that as he wanted us to do, to make it more updated from time to time. So this is a presentation on a theme, the theme being the population and how it is settled in various parts of the city and how the city and its environs are growing. So let me start with a simple animation of what uh, Vikram has just been presenting through maps. Well, this is taken and worked on from Mutaya's own book, and this is where we start. We start with these two points where the city was established in around 1640s, where a sandy strip of five kilometers long and two kilometers wide on the Coom River mouth was deeded to the East India Company on 22nd July 1639 by one Mr. Damarla Nayak Venkadadari, who was the governor in the Vijayanagara Empire. 
Now we come, this is 1640, these two small spots, that is where the city started. Then in 1676, we have these areas added, which is triplicate. This was obtained on rent from the Sultan of Golconda. And White Town came into existence within the fort. And as uh, Vikram showed you, the Black Town was also established north of it. Cut to 1708. Uh, in between 1688, we have the first corporation in Asia created by the Royal Charter issued by King James II in December 1687. But it began to function only after the clear delineation of its duties in 1856. So we had the first corporation of Asia created by a royal charter in Chennai. In 1693, we had the acquisition of Egmore, Porasavakam, and Tondayarpet on annual lease from the Emperor Aurangzeb, and that is what the uh, yellow areas and the green areas depict. Then in 1708, we have the acquisition of Tirvatyur, Nungambakam, Vyasarpadi, Ennor and Satangadu from the Nawab Daud Khan. Going forward, we have Chindadri Pet in 1734. Then in 1742, we have the grant of Veperi, Periyamed, Pudupakam, Ernavur, and Sadeangupam from the Nawab of Karnatak. Then again in uh, 1749, we have Santom and Mailapur which were occupied by the English in the name of their alliance with Golconda against France. Then we have the road, 1766. A road leading to St. Thomas Mount was built from the southwest gate of the fort called Mount Road. It was widened in 1776 and a bridge was built across the Coom River in 1805. In between, we have the city developing its infrastructure we have 1792, the Madras Observatory, 1819, the Ophthalmic Hospital, 1835, the Madras Medical School, in 1855, the Chepak Palace, the Zoo, and the Public Telegraph is introduced. And in 1856, we have a railway line open from Madras to Arakonam. 1857, we have the University of Madras, and 1873, the Central Station is established. Then cut to 1876, a canal named after the Duke of Buckingham was constructed in the entire 9 to 11 yards in width with 28 locks, which becomes a major mode of transportation. In 1941, we have Mambalam included in Madras. 1946, some surrounding villages of Chengalpur district having an area of 15.162 kilometers included. And in 1978, we have 12 village panchayats, Tiruvanmur, Virgambakam, Taramani, Velacheri, Saligramam, Kodambakam, Koyambed, Kodangiyur, Tirumangalam, Kolathur, Villivakam, and Erganjeri included in the city. And we have more or less the entire map of modern Madras, which developed from that two small villages uh, on the sandy strips at the mouth of the Kua. Now let's see how the city population has grown as compared to the urban agglomeration around the city. So while you see the uh, Chennai urban agglomeration represented by the green line there, it has been growing in the last decade alone uh, till 2011 at the rate of about 37 percent. But the city has been declining. The core city which I showed you, has been declining from, uh, say, 45.2% in 6171 down to just 7% in the last decade. So where has this uh, population been growing? So this is very interesting to see where the population settled. In 71, if you see, the core areas, the so-called CBD, is relatively empty and the population is settling around the peripheries. So this is where the peripheries, you have uh, the population settling down. But in 81, you see this consolidation and you see more and more areas of the periphery 
getting populated while the core is still relatively unoccupied. In 1991, however, you see that the periphery is coming into the core. If you see what was a single bungalow before has become a multi-storied uh, flat where five people used to stay, 50 people are staying, and therefore the city is converging back into the center. So usually they have theories that, you know, the, there is a sprawl, an urban sprawl which sprawls outwards. And since we cannot sprawl on the side of, this, of the sea, we sprawl towards the south and to the west. So you see by 1991, you see the core areas getting more and more populated again. And by 2001, this area, which was fairly unoccupied before, is again started showing signs of more occupancy. Now let's take the agglomeration around Chennai. The green area is depicted here as the core city and the areas around is the Chennai urban agglomeration in 1981. So these were the units added in 1991 and these were the units dropped in 1991 from the Chennai urban agglomeration. Going forward to 1991, you see the city, the urban agglomeration expanding and all around the core city you have units which are being added to the urban agglomeration of Chennai. In 2011, you see the further extension down those yellow areas have been added and the city is growing towards the south and the west. And if you see the population settlement, you will find in 1991, the core areas of the population are still sparse. And you have uh, the peripheral areas which have population over 40,000. In 2001, this, as I mentioned to you, they start coming back towards the core of the city. And by 2011, you find almost the CBD again, the city converging back to the center. So we did an uh, exercise where we took where is this population from the core business district and you find that the entire centroid of population is going towards the south and the west. So you see there in 1981 the centroid was there, then in 1991 it slid down and in 2011. So from the northeast to the southwest, this is how the city is growing. Now imagine that this city was planned for a certain population. Its entire infrastructure was designed for that population. And today it has to support a population exponentially bigger than what it was planned for. Retrofitting a city is not that easy. And therefore it would take a lot of investment, a lot of planning to ensure that the uh, areas where the city is expanding. You would find that, you know, your IT corridor or this, they are still village panchayats. They have no sewerage system. There are huge modern IT buildings, but they do not have even a sewerage system, an underground sewerage system, because they are still panchayats. So I think maps would give you a very, uh, it's a very handy tool to see where the city is growing, what are the core points around which the city is going to expand and how do we plan for the future. So this uh, is a very small presentation. So if you see here, uh, the percentage of population by distance from the central uh, business district, you have the central high density rim. Uh, if you take the red line, which is the percentage share in 2011, now you see a peak at the 20 to 25 kilometer from the central business district. That is where the population is now uh, growing. And therefore, we need to plan for the future. We need to go right up to the 45 to 50 kilometer around the city, plan for the infrastructure, make the necessary investments that are needed to make Chennai a modern metropolis. Today, we are ranked 33rd among in the international metropolitan cities. So it's high time that we use scientific tools to ensure that the city meets the challenges that are going to come up in the future.
So that was my short presentation. Uh, let's give a big hand to Vikram for that fantastic presentation. Can we have you back here, Vikram, for the question and answer sessions? I'd request you to just raise your hand, the mic would reach you, and then you could uh, make your, put your questions to Vikram. Vikram, you showed a photo of this Mare's, you know, is that the Mare company? The Murray handbook that I showed was from Murray and Company, the auctioneers. Yes. Um, I don't think so. Murray is, a, first of all, thank you for attending the first iteration of this and coming again. Uh, I hope uh, it has uh, uh, worthwhile. Um, so Pradeep was at the very first talk um, on this subject. Um, no, I, I think Murray is a sort of a, you know, like uh, uh, four doors, that kind of, you know, international guide. Those are quaint books you get in the, I'm also a book collector, and they're well sought after, these uh, tourist guides. There have also been Marais for Bombay, for Bangalore. Uh, the Marais for India is beautiful because, you know, of course, it, for people who visited India in 1900, from Peshawar to Calcutta to Delhi, so, but it is a different Marais. These, I think these people just chose the name. They're not even called, it's not the Marais family that run the auctioneers. I don't know that the others would know, so. Thank just you. wanted to know whether Aishar bought out a series of maps on Madras because they came up with a series of maps in Madras in 90s and 2000s. Yes. And also Mr. Mutai was head of DT Maps. Did he strive to bring out a map of Madras? Did he, did he publish anything? Because I don't seem to see any... Aishar did. Aishar did. Aishar did have a map of okay. Madras okay. and it was fairly detailed. Yeah. Yeah. Was I, yeah, TT Maps did it, yeah. And Mutai yeah. was the head, I suppose. Well, I nominated Mr. Mutaya for a Padma Award on the ground that he's the person who rescued, uh, who created indigenous maps for school children. Yeah. Until then, uh, Indian school children used German atlases. And I felt that that was a contribution that of his that went unheralded and was not well known. But he had persuaded the Survey of India, who you may know is notorious for good reason, for protecting our sort of cartographical heritage and secrets of boundaries and, uh, you know, uh, but he persuaded them to allow maps to be made, atlases to be made in India. So that, I think, is a remarkable feature of his work, which is to have Indian-made atlases rather than using foreign atlases, which, you know, many generations of school children did. Vikram, I wanted to know, how do you source your maps, the original maps and the reprints, and how do you preserve them? Do you have it framed or do you have it a special way that you preserve these maps and uh, is there any other collector in Chennai who collects these maps? Well, I, you know, map making is a bit like art where people don't like to talk, right? So I like to talk but I don't have that many maps. Most of these maps I have in duplicate or I can't afford them or they are not available. Like that Fadden map I would love to have but it's sold for $10,000. I don't have that kind of money to buy it but more than that I think that you can get a beautiful replica of it when nobody will tell the difference. Uh, you can even get it as a bedspread, I discovered last night. If you want to sleep under a map of Madras with it as a counterpane, there is a website that would actually print these maps in exquisite detail, if that's what your idea of Indian of Madras heritage uh, is. But, um, so I'm happy with those sort of things. The maps I do have uh, are bought, uh, I generally believe not spending too much money on these things because, you know, they are ephemeral. But also, um, uh, they are not typically sourced from here because you never know the authenticity. And Madras is particularly a hostile climate for any kind of books, maps, stamps, uh, just because of the nature, unless you live in a truly air-conditioned home where the temperature is kept constant. It's actually difficult to get maps uh, of quality here. There are private collectors in the city who do have very decent collections, but they do go to extraordinary details to keep them. And I certainly don't want to be, let's say, violating any Antiquities Act uh, by you know, taking a map uh, outside India. And actually, like I said, most of these maps are be best sourced outside. But again, I now believe that there's no point in paying a, you know, a large premium for a map which may be degraded in quality when you can actually get a replica that is fairly good uh, as a uh, high quality uh, replica which you can actually print and exhibit, which actually may be better for the map itself than we put it, because maps are like, 
you know, like our skin, right? They react to, to the sunlight. So unless you live in it, that's why the best maps are all in England. There's not much sunlight. Uh, and so unless you're willing to protect and preserve them that way, uh, it's much better to have sort of enjoy them through, you know, uh, sort of, let's say, uh, facsimile uh, or uh, reproductions. Thank you. Does the archive, which is opposite the Edmo station, have a good collection of maps on Madras? Have yes. you visited that? The answer is yes. The answer is yes, but I never got to see them uh, for reasons that many of us who are researchers know. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, there is uh, a, a remarkable book. Uh, well, Mr. Love's book um, is based on the collection that is there. There is a guy who wrote a piece after one of the. Love used lots of assistants, right? He had many Indian assistants. One of whom wrote a piece on the maps of the Madras archives, now the Tamil Nadu archives. I have an IAS officer friend who's very fascinated by this, who went in there and inspected them, uh, and he told me they're all in great condition. But that's good. I think, you know, if I don't really need to see the original, but if these can be digitized, uh, I think that that heritage can be shared. But, you know, that's a larger project. You know, they have sort of other priceless manuscripts and uh, documents that also need work on. So. Hi, sir. Good evening. Thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation, both of you. Uh, my name is Prashant. Uh, my question is not about Madras map specifically, uh, but there's something called the Squatsburg Atlas, which is available online uh, at the DSAL uh, of University of Chicago, the Digital South Asia Library. Uh, my question specifically was, A, is there a hard copy version of it available in India somewhere? Because the map itself is very informative, while available online, it's not particularly viewable. And two, whether there are other similar maps where uh, you also have the maps, but they also have a good history. And the maps itself are so detailed in terms of uh, you know, dynasties or politics, political events, and things like that. So that, that was my question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, thank you for your question and for coming. I don't uh, know about this particular atlas or map you mentioned. But of course, I'm familiar with DSAL. And one or two of these maps were sourced from there, although I did try to mention all of the sources because in some cases I had to license them to download. Um, but I think that uh, there are other um, sort of uh, resources of that, this nature. Um, most importantly, there's a map collector called David Rumsey who has the best collection of Madras maps. The problem is they are not well researched. Like even the Fadden map is wrongly sourced. He suggests that the Fadden map was created by cadets of the Madras Survey School. And I have not found any evidence to, you know, to corroborate that assertion in the, in the description. It was written for some auction, obviously, where they had to sell it. So uh, sometimes you know, there is a bit of, uh, especially if they don't have area specialists. Um, so, but they do, uh, do high resolution uh, um, sort of uploads of the map, rare maps they have. So does Stanford. And the Bibliothèque Nationale, the French National Archives, I actually think has the most fantastic collection of Madras maps uh, that are available if you can uh, know your way around the, although now with Google will translate the French website. But there's also maps from the Portuguese archives, uh, the maps from the British Museum, the British Royal Collection. And now the Survey of India also has a fairly decent map collection. The National Library in Calcutta is also now planning, uh, there's actually a Tamil lady who is the uh, head of the map collection. Um, and uh, I, I'm hoping that they also uh, reveal their uh, treasures. Uh, and uh, the National Archives uh, also has a very good collection. And as you know, there is now a web website called Abhilek Patel, which is our National Archives of India fantastic website where they are digitizing high resolution files. I haven't seen any maps there, but I'm hoping that also is a, a website uh, or a resource we can tap into. Just to add a technical detail, yes. the Survey of India does not authenticate any maps other than international boundaries and state boundaries. So below that, there are no certified maps in the country. All others are thematic maps which do not have an authentic stamp from the Survey of India. You were involved you, in the survey. I was the registrar general, but yeah, I, thought, uh, we, I wanted to mention that we so. did not we did not find uh, boundaries certified by the Survey of India beyond the district boundaries. So that is one point. 
You could also use the light maps. Now they use, you know, the night. Uh, they take satellite imagery of the lighting, which is the, and with that they predict the population density. So there are many modern things which have come about, and I think the uh, space uh, department has given every uh, la with lat longs. They have maps which are available on their portal, so you could look up that too. Uh, Vikram, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what the Raj maps left out and what that says about the way in which the British exercised power, what kind of priorities they had while ruling India at the time. I was dreading this question because I knew it would be some uh, question that's beyond my sort of, let's say, capacity to answer since I'm not a trained historian or a critical one. Um, but yeah, I mean, maps will represent bias, right? There will be, uh, so Rajeshekran can tell us, uh, because, you know, he's one of, who has sort of, uh, sort of kind of sensitized me to the importance of understanding what's behind a map, if you read his article. And I never look now at a map uh, in, the, in the same way, because there are layers that uh, beyond what might just be, uh, you know, fairly simple factual details. Um, and so the exclusions from a map are often telling. But in order to understand and appreciate those exclusions, you have to get uh, to sort of understand the milieu in which they were created and who made them. They were obviously mostly men who made maps. So there is that itself sort of a, a, a you know, a, a, an influence in itself. Um, but it was also these privileged men who obviously had access to good education. Um, and in most cases, uh, they sourced maps based on access to sort of other, um, you know, elite uh, repositories of knowledge. There is nothing wrong in collecting these maps or appreciating their beauty. Uh, or I'm not someone, therefore, who, and I know you didn't say this, but who, who apologizes because I collect uh, sort of these antiquarian colonial maps. Lots of Americans ask me, why do you collect these maps of these people who colonized and oppressed you? Uh, now, as unless I, I, there are sort of racist, racist uh, depictions, which I do not collect. So I would not, for instance, keep uh, any of the mutiny pa paintings. Um, but it is part of our evolution and our history. And so I collect them with the realization that these are obviously not, uh, you know, certifiable truths. And uh, to come to your question, there is a lot of uh, new writing uh, with Madras as a base on how maps were used as a source of knowledge in the Foucauldian sense, but also a source of um, propagating uh, British or um, the colonial legitimacy and imperialism, but also the work of Sumati Ramaswamy, uh, the great scholar of, uh, of Tamil Nadu, but also of, of the Indian national movement, shows you how the national movement also appropriated maps, right? So it is, uh, I think that map making has, is uh, maps just like currency or coins or stamps will always reflect a certain uh, sense of uh, uh, identity that, uh, you know, uh, is associated with, um, with power, with uh, privilege. Um, and so I think as long as you're alert to that, uh, you know, it's fine to collect them, but also to say that that's why I find it very interesting to talk about now this democratization that's taking place in map making, right, where people are now making maps to fill vacuums. Uh, and you find, for instance, within Twitter, a big community critiquing these maps. So somebody puts up the map saying, I've just made this through open source of the multimodal nodes. And somebody said, well, where are the connections to the buses? Where are the connections to ensure that, you know, there's a, a public safety aspect, right? So I think that is quite exciting, too, to see in a way now we have a much larger stakeholder, uh, a group of stakeholders involved in making maps, uh, unlike ever before. G my, good evening, sir. My name is Aditi Srivatsan. I'm a student of Sishya OMR school. And I had a question for both uh, Chandramali, sir, as well as Vikram, sir. And this question is not specifically about maps rather than Madras and its history in general. And when Sir was talking about the establishment of the black town, etc., uh, we recognized that Madras Day was kind of made in honor of it being stole, of it being sold from the Vijayanagar Empire to the British. And so 
what is your opinions on Madras Day very specifically being celebrated in honor of this region of Madras being sold specifically to be uh, used and exploited for cloth production and why is that the day that we are really celebrating? Is What's your opinion on that? Well, <laughs> I, I have a private view as a citizen but I'm not obviously a, an expert on the what they call, what a historian would call the historiography of Madras Day. But there is a very good talk which took place, I think, on the 15th or 16th of August 2021 by Sriram on the evolution of Madras Day. And it is remarkable because he tries to track everybody who was involved in the Madras Day movement, right from the bikers to, uh, you know, people like Nivedita, Luis, uh, people who are, you know, like Vincent, uh, who have been involved in the Madras Day movement. Maybe Minskin can answer this question more appropriately, yeah, you? since you're, uh, in a way, the informal this custodian this of the Madras Day. going to land on to too many debates. That's OK. She's asked but, the question, so maybe. Yeah. So, so uh, we are not here to, we are celebrating the city the way you would like to celebrate it. Uh, I think it's mistakenly taken. We need a date, and therefore, Mr. Mutaya suggested that the date is not about uh, the British doing something, but uh, a, a step that was taken which led to the foundation of a metropolis. Uh, there are people who say, well, didn't people live uh, pre-1639 and I mean, you know, what's happened, I mean, and stuff like that. Yeah, people did. But the fact is that, and if you looked at those maps, is that the, the formation, uh, the East India Company, and whatever they, the steps that they took led to the formation of this metropolis. And therefore, we decided that we would then take the foundation of the fort, uh, leading to the foundation of the city and the formation of the city. So we are not here to celebrate uh, black, white, orange, colonial or not. We are just celebrating the city the way we would like to do it, and it's completely voluntary. If you go to the website, which has all the events of Madras Day, You'll find a lot of events are going to be about Madras even before the British came. And I'd strongly encourage you to attend some of those with your friends. Yes, sir. Uh, Vikram Bissang would ask you the same question. <laughs> the College of Engineering that you refer to only of your slides, I did ask you whether it refers to the College of Engineering. You said yes, but at that time it was not the... So I would like you to tell more about this because... I'm a student of College of Engineering and I'd like to see there's a bit of a connection there. Yes, this is a subject I know less than most people in this room. Obviously, College of Engineering grads are very proud people, like IITians. So I certainly don't want to hold forth on that. But Mr. Love, uh, Henry, Henry Davison Love, was for 27 years either the assistant or principal or the principal of the college. I think he arrives in Madras in 17, 1876 and he leaves in 1921, um, uh, 1927, no, 1917, I forget. One of these days, but it's, uh, it adds up to 27 years. Uh, but at that time, the college was not in Gindi. So it was not the College of Engineering in Gindi, it was yeah. just the College of Engineering. I think it had and grown it all, beyond. Uh, it also housed the office of the... Survey, trigonometrical yes, survey. Yes, but that was in Kalsa Mahal? Yeah, or in, I think it uh, in, was in, in no, called the Chepo, Survey School. Yes, yeah. It was then called the Survey School. That was the under survey. the East India Company. Uh, uh, but the late, by, the, I, by the time love comes in, in the late 19th century, it is the College of Engineering or School of Engineering, but it has not moved to Gindi yet. That's why I didn't make that connection. Okay. Uh, Mike, I think one lady up there wanted to ask, sir. Uh, before. You'll have to do without yeah. the mic. Yeah. yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry. I was your part of the speech. You were okay. starting drafting. But I attended yours. But however, it's just a question. The maps and, you know, how Chennai uh, has progressed from the name change to Madras. Do you think there's a fairly good representation of, you know, uh, the maps in, let's say, movies or, like, you know, shows? Or... <laughs> Like, you know, what is your take on that? That's my first question. And sir, to you, you said that we speak uh, Chennai ranks uh, 33rd. Why is that? Because I'm from Bangalore and it's been like almost 11 months. And one great thing that I love about Chennai 
is that the traffic here at least moves, unlike <laughs> Bangalore. And the metro is so well connected, unlike Bangalore. So I would like to know, like, what else do you think Chennai needs to like improve on? Just these two questions. The representation part and the No, I, as I mentioned, the city was planned for a certain population. The population has grown exponentially and we know the direction that the population settlements are taking. And therefore, the retrofitting of the city's civic services needs to keep pace if it is not to collapse. It means drinking water, it means sewerage, it means garbage disposal, it means a whole lot of things which have to be scientifically planned, based, and now prediction is pretty much possible using scientific data. You could predict both the spatial as well as the actual population growth. So this is something which we will have to take very seriously and plan for the future growth. The growth poles have to be set much beyond the present limits. We have to probably think of growth up to Arakonam on this side or you know even further away and plan for the infrastructure to, to support the population growth which is going to come. So on your question, you know, it's an interesting question. I thought of two nights ago, and I emailed four people, and I only got one response, because I also was interested in the depiction of maps in, in, in uh, culture and films. Now, I do not watch most films, uh, whether Tamil or English or Hindi. So I am very impoverished in that respect. One person responded to me, sending me a map of Ponni and Selvan, uh, but in Kalki's book. This man is a true Ponni and Selvan uh, Kalki fan, that he has not watched the movie, which he feels is uh, inauthentic. And it's true, he's, he's one of the greatest Kalki scholars, uh, great uh, historian, I don't want to embarrass who he is, he's a great historian of the city. But uh, he said, uh, I have not watched the movie, but here is the actual uh, map that Kalki puts in the, in the magazine, right, uh, in the sequence, uh, in, in, the, in, in one of the episodes. Um, that map is an interesting map because it comes up to Mamalapuram, but it's mostly of the delta, obviously. Now, I'm sure that Kalki didn't really find this map, and it was recreating sort of the battles and the, the, the places that are in the movie and in the book, in the, in, in the uh, series. Uh, but I think this is a good topic that uh, there are lots of uh, film buffs in the city uh, who maybe can uh, sort of uh, explore in another iteration. I think uh, most movies show Google, Google yeah. Earth coming down from, you know, 60,000 feet to... Which incidentally has a connection with IIT because Sundar Pichai studied in Vanavani and he had fought with his wife and that's how Google Maps came in. <laughs> 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 they couldn't reach a particular place. And then, then he came back without going for the dinner, and that's how Google Maps came. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, we have one, two, someone there, three. Yeah, please. Yes, sir. Uh, what really triggered the passion for the subject, despite being alive? <laughs> Well, despite being a lawyer. Uh, yes, I, I think that um, I actually got interested in it for two reasons. It comes from this city, actually. I was a stamp collector. Um, and that interest comes as a sort of schoolboy here. There is a famous, uh, well, not so famous anymore, but it's uh, at the time pre-social media. There were not that many places which nurtured uh, sort of school children in other uh, aspects. But one exception was the South India Philatelist Association a group of stamp collectors who were very passionate people. And the condition to join them, I joined them as 13 or 14 years old, was that when you went to their meetings, you had to speak, right? So it made you forget, get rid of stage fright. And you could speak either in Tamil or English, uh, but you had to speak. And they were these people who had, you know, so stamp collecting is sort of a quaint hobby now, but uh, it was a fairly, it is still quite vibrant. Um, and the idea of, representing something so small in miniature uh, makes you, you know, they're, so, they're obsessed about errors and printings and, you know, there is this cross there but not on that the watermark. So I, after a point, thought, who am I going to show this collection to? Nobody is interested in stamps. When I say, would you like to see my stamp collection, people actually don't even, sometimes, you know, younger people don't even know what that means. But I felt, okay, since all of 
hobbies are, there is this element of narcissism of showing off. Maybe it's better to go to something bigger. And that's how I got into maps. <laughs> From stamps. We have that. Hello. My name is Gopu. Actually, I was. I thought the setup was perfect to the answer to the previous question. We talked about Google. The Google Maps is the maps today that everybody uses. And I was just surprised that your uh, presentation didn't end with that rather than... Don't you think Google has more data than all the maps previous combined? Of course, the historical interest is much more with the uh, paper maps created. Um, well, that is true. Um, no, sorry, please continue. No, that's it. Yeah. That was no that is true. In fact, I got this feedback in my earlier presentation, but I didn't have time to go back and then have a Google dimension. But you know Google. Uh, so in a way, uh, to me, so first of all, I will be honest, I don't use Google Maps. I find it unreliable uh, when I drive. Uh, and uh, for whatever reason, I am always lost when I'm on Google Maps. Uh, but that just may be my own quirk. Secondly, I think Google Maps is a great, fantastic resource, Google Earth and all of the stuff we see. But it's obviously sourced through sort of, you know, some sort of seeding, right? I mean, in, in, based on where this truck goes and what photographs it takes. So I think that is, of course, a great resource. But I'm more interested in what we build from Google Earth or whatever the, the data set is, uh, which is uh, Google Earth cannot show, well, I guess it can show you. For instance, I'm very interested in driving and going to bookshops before they all close. So I actually found recently a Google, somebody creating a Google map where they link all these bookshops in one sort of, you know, drive uh, through sort of map. But uh, I still think there are other resources beyond Google that uh, exist. Yeah, and a lot, of, lot of Indian companies like Map My India and yeah, things like that. Map My India, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So my point is that I wouldn't Probably, I have nothing against them, but I'm always against a monopoly uh, or our reliance on something that becomes uh, sort of the monopoly. And just as these maps were entirely uh, representation, rep representing obviously a point, we have to be mindful of the fact that Google Earth, as wide and big as it is, may not be uh, the full sort of picture. We have a question there. Thank you for your <laughs> Um, thank you for very compelling talks. Thank you. Uh, really enjoyed it. So my question really picks up on that gentleman's question about the blind spaces and, and Google, in a sense. I know you didn't want to do a post colonial okay. thing, but you used the word football and kind of walked into it. So uh, I was just wondering if, you, if both of you can reflect on another slightly more philosophical note of the map is not the center. Which you know, portraits and others have written about it. So I was just curious the word imagination and ephemera did come up in your thoughts. So if you could just respond to that. I think she said both of us, so I will let you <laughs> This is a very convenient pass. Uh, well, it is a tool, it is definitely not the center. I mean, it represents different themes. I mean, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Seeing, seeing a theme being depicted on a spatial plane, on a geospatial plane, I think gives you a better understanding of the distribution of the relative, uh, you know, depth. It gives you a sense of depth when you look at a, a thematic depiction on a spatial plane. So in that sense, I would say that, you know, it's a very, very useful theme to, uh, to imagine how things are at present and how they're going to be in the future by using these big data. Many techniques have come up where you can project and then thematically represent on, on maps. And that would give you a very, very uh, lucid explanation of where we are heading and from where we have come. I hope that satisfies you. That's all that comes to mind now. <laughs> yeah, Vikram. So I, I would just very brief. I, I haven't read enough about Bourget and much less of Foucault. Uh, either, I mean, obviously, I can't read that to that degree in French. But um, I think that I'll give you an example of how I understood this. I, I like giving maps as gifts to people. 
maybe because of my own interest. And sometimes I forget when you do that, people may not appreciate, my, may not have my antiquarian sensibilities of a map. I gave a map of Africa, of particularly of Rhodesia, to a colleague of mine who was uh, from Zimbabwe. And I said, this is your wedding present. She was outraged and offended. She said, you're giving me a racist map. Um, and I hadn't thought of it that way, right? I said, but my office, I have lots of British maps, and I'm not worried about, you know, their, I mean, I, I view them sort of. And I think that that was a good realization for me that map making is not as benign or viewed necessarily as this sort of fascinating um, hobby that by other people. They, you know, she genuinely thought this was an, in, a representation of oppression, which uh, you know, revolted her. Right? So it was a good wake up call for me in that respect. The other thing I would say is if you look at old maps, uh, particularly from you know, the 1800s, and you look at the, the, the continental shelf, right? They show the continental shelf almost contiguous with the coastline. But we know of geography now, that's not the case. The continental shelf is not perfectly contiguous with the coastline. But it represents whatever knowledge at that point, which assumed that the continental, the, 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 the continental shelf went down sloping, perfectly contiguous with the coastline. So that is a very nice reminder to us that it, it is a knowledge system that was imperfect which tried to capture whatever was known there, but obviously it had its limitations. The, uh, the, the map which you showed about the Pope, the Pope, is it the study which you have done, or have you seen it from the We have done it in the census. We have plotted the, uh, the population as it grew through the censuses. And, uh, these are all based on data which has come out in the censuses. But you see a sort of... Yeah, yeah, of course. These are all published data in our uh, census report. So they, are, they base their uh, master plans on the uh, data which we produce. Uh, so can, uh, can you talk about the Madras Medical College and the old building as well as where it is right now? I have no idea, ma'am. Not that is another question. topic for another day. And <laughs> we'll call is, an expert on that. Vincent has got the catalog of all the events, so you may want to look at this. This is just the one. There's lots of others. You can follow the Madras Day uh, event. So somebody might answer this question along the way. Uh, was that the last question here? Yeah, uh, I think we have too many hands up. Can I, can In I the interest of time, we'll just take all those three questions and answer one. Sure. Yeah, please. Sure. I, I think uh, what one I wanted to... One minute. Right there. So, so what we've seen throughout is, is basically the historical maps and, and the cultural aspects and, and why they are so interesting because of, you know, how, how uh, you know, we've evolved and so on. But, but what I would really like to know is like, what are the, uh, you know, technological advances? So now we have like satellites beaming, uh, you know, and taking snapshots. Uh, we have drones. Uh, we have big data systems which can, you know, uh, call, you know, lay, overlay certain information on the map. W what are the technological advances which, which are of interest, especially in urban planning or, or uh, you know, certain economic uh, surveys or things like that? Yeah. We have a question from you. Okay. Where does the name come from, Madras? Okay. Okay. Question? Yeah. Next one. I would like to add, oh, sir, uh, hello. I would like to address for the both of you, like, as you told, with the increase in population, there needs to be more urbanization. But like the environment is also like the, there's more deforestation, like for marshlands are like right behind my house due to like the ECR connection. They are like they like fully like uh, grounded up the marshland, which are like many birds coming, which I like used to like to see in, uh, early in the mornings. Which like due to like urbanization, they are like cut down many of the trees and like the birds have come and as well as like the new ground. Like, have you seen like the Torai uh, the the showing uh, intersection where there is an entire huge marshland? They like urbanizing it and like most of the birds like there used to be like uh, flocks and flocks of birds used to come there and there's like no wildlife wildlife coming there. So like I would like to ask your idea like how would like how would it be easier and uh, like not to stop like deforestation and decreasing wildlife? How can we like urbanize better? Yeah. Can we? I think those are the questions. Yes. 
I yeah, think answers. the last question you can answer better than I. Yeah, basically, you see, urbanization is not something, you know, which you create. It's the pressure of the population which leads to people settling in certain areas. And when that area becomes of a certain size, it starts becoming from a village to a town panchayat, from a town panchayat to a municipality, from a municipality to the corporation. So it is a basically uh, the agglomeration of people at certain places which creates urban areas. From This is what distinguishes a rural area from an urban area. Now usually urban areas sprawl. Now for Chennai, the sprawl cannot happen because one side we have the sea. So the sprawl can happen only northwards and southwards, westwards. So that is where it is going. The population is settling down. Earlier it was in the core. It is now moving down southwest. So what we are trying to say is these areas need to be planned, not unplanned growth that you know you try to start putting the infrastructure after the population has settled. So unless this goes hand in hand and you create the infrastructure anticipating what the future population growth is going to be, where they're going to settle, create amenities for that, we would be failing. That was the point which was being made. On the technology part of it, today everything is, earlier we used to do it by pen and uh, we used to mark points and we used to draw. But today the entire process, there are ArcGIS, there are many softwares which are available. Some are very, very sophisticated uh, softwares. We use satellite imagery. We overlay the physical, because there is nothing, there is no boundary from the sky. You just can't take a drone photograph and say that, okay, where is the boundary? You have to overlay the administrative boundary on top of the, so these are called layers. So when you take the base map and lay different layers, but the problem here is there is no standardization. If you take the rural development, they have their own jurisdiction. They call it panchayats. If you take the revenue administration, they call it revenue villages. Each one of them have different boundaries on the map. Now overlaying these boundaries on the base topo uh, sheet, this is where technology comes in, how to lay those layers one on top of the other and then you could put in the themes also on top of it and so there's a very scientific process which is now used for map making so it could be thematic maps it could be uh, basically you know administrative maps and so there are very interesting technologies which are there so that will re require a huge uh, session by itself yeah. just very quickly since you asked um, i mean that can take a whole subject uh, an hour by itself on the name but uh, the best account is in Mr. Mutaya's book of course he strongly believes that Madras was the name and should not have been changed so there is that bias but his great protege Sriram has now I guess slightly changed his view and he has done a one hour a, a half an hour on why he now thinks Chennai should now be the name we should use so uh, I would urge you to watch that on YouTube. Uh, and then there's a third person who writes, uh, who's somewhat obscure, J.B.P. Moore, uh, who also writes on this issue. Uh, we do, I don't have enough familiarity with the Tamil literature on the subject to point the other, pr provide you the other point of view, but there is a certain other point of view as well on why T uh, Chennai was chosen and indeed was the name that was always used uh, in Tamil. So it was basically, you know, making a Tamil name. It wasn't a new name in that sense. They used the Tamil name to make it the English name. The propriety and wisdom of that has been debated. That there are three or four explanations which are in in Mr. Mutaya's book. On again, they are speculations. But the maps that I've shown you, they all say Madras, Madras Patnam, Patnam Madras Madres Patnam. The sort of variations on that theme, and then the corruption to Madras, which occurs quite quickly, actually. It, that is one possible one 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 theory that Mr. Mutaya entertains. There are others as well. So. Also, the mother. Yeah, yeah. So we come to an end on this note. We must thank Vikram for taking the time out. He lives in Washington D.C., and on his visits to Chennai. 
He is always in every function of the Madras week or anything that is happening and he has been to CIC also every time he comes to Chennai. So welcome and we hope to see more of you in the next uh, visit of yours. So thank you very much. Now Sabaris, would you like to announce the next events? Good evening ladies and gentlemen. So on 11th, we, are, we have a talk on Bharat 100 by Dr. Rajiv Kumar. He, is the, he was the ex-vice chairman of Niti Aayog. So he is coming down and we are having it here, 6 to 7.30 p.m. on 11th of August. 19th, we have it on advertising. So uh, Pradeep, uh, Pradeep sir here is going to moderate and that's going to that's gonna be about uh, Raja Rajiv Verma's images, how things have changed from those times to now. So that, that's happening in MOP. So that's between 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. So uh, that's happening on 19th of August. And 26th, we have the Literature Festival happening in Auroville, if I'm not wrong. So these are the uh, events planned for the month of August. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So we would encourage all of you to please attend all these events. We are partnering with the Auroville for the International Literary Festival and a number of international uh, 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 authors are coming to Auroville. So you're all welcome to visit uh, Auroville during the uh, Lit Fest there. Uh, plus this session which Pradeep is going to take is I think a very interesting one on the lithographs which were the main medium of advertisement and how it has changed over the years. I think we'll have a very interesting session with Pradeep also. So please do come for all those sessions and thank you for coming in large numbers today. Thank you.